I want you to develop an unshakable mindset so that on the day of a competition, there is absolutely nothing that can throw you off. That's what we're going to talk about today with Kevin Richardson. You are listening to the Mindset Forge podcast where athletes and performing artists discuss their biggest moments in life and sport and how they show up for the big moments. I'm your host, Barton Bryan. I'm an athlete, I'm a performing artist, and I love helping people understand how to be better in the moments that matter most. And today is no exception. I get to talk with Kevin Richardson. He plays on the Dallas Legion Ultimate Frisbee team and is known as K Rich. He's a professional ultimate frisbee player and a top-level athlete doing competitions like CG Games and High Rocks. In this interview, we delve into team sports, how he got into ultimate frisbee, some of the concepts that are unique about frisbee that don't really happen in other sports. It's one of the only sports where you cannot score by yourself. You literally need someone else on your team to help you score. That's a unique perspective on being a great teammate versus just taking over a game like in basketball where you can go score 30 points and help your team win. While listening to the podcast, I want you thinking about how is he working towards that competition months in advance so that when he shows up on the day of that competition, there is absolutely nothing that will throw off his confidence. He knows he has put in the work. He knows he has done everything he can to be at his best. And you can too. Remember, collective goal here, we're all striving to be 1% better each and every week by listening to this podcast. So here it is, my friend, Kevin Richardson. Kevin, how are you doing today? Bart, I'm great. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm excited. Yeah, man. I, I'm excited to introduce my listeners to the sport of ultimate Frisbee and also high rocks and some of the things that you're doing. I think a lot of people probably won't know some of these terms or understand necessarily exactly what it's like. So uh, this will be an opportunity for you to give us some information on what, what's happening out there in these high level uh, competitions and, and of course, ultimate frisbee at that kind of highest level that you're at, but then also talking to us about your preparation, some of the things that you're doing to to keep your body at the highest level so that you can compete in those competitions and on that team. So uh, I want to start right in with team sports. Talk to me about your mindset around being a, a great teammate. Yeah, everybody grows up playing team sports. They play basketball, football, soccer, and, and as I got older, um, got into college. I wanted to, to stay with that. I wanted to find a, a team sport. And I found Ultimate Frisbee. It's been amazing. And I think it goes back to day in and day out. You have to really worry about what you're doing and make sure that you're ready for that game. You're ready for a big tournament weekend. And it's a lot of personal things. But when it comes to that Saturday morning, when you lace up those cleats and you look around your 25 best friends, your 25 buddies, and, and you one, you have to to trust that they also put in the work for themselves. Um, but frisbee is a sport that you can't win by yourself. It's only one of the only sports I found that you can't even score by yourself. You have to throw from one player to another player, and that player's got to catch it in the end zone. Um, you know, basketball could be an individual sport, even though it's a five on five game. Football, you got the quarterback and you got the running back and those types of things. But frisbee, it truly takes two people to score one point, um, which is a very unique thing about the sport. And that's what I've always brought into. You know, my training side, my 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 playing side is we got to do this together. Uh, much like our, our business that we partner with uh, Bar is better together. Um, Frisbee kind of holds that sentiment as well that I've been playing is we're better together. We have to be out here and work hard off the field because when we're on the field, we, we absolutely 100% need each other out there. So give us a little bit more clarity on the sport of ultimate Frisbee so that people can understand it better. Yeah, I think if, if someone was to, to look up or Google ultimate Frisbee right now, they're going to probably find the, the pro division of ultimate Frisbee. There's pro and club. They're very similar. They're 99% similar. The, there's some differences. Mainly, though, it's seven on seven. We're playing, think about a football field. So sideline to sideline and end zone to end zone. Our end zones are actually 20 yards deep instead of 10 yards like a football field. So we play from the 10 yard line in, which makes our playing field, our, um, you know, the main part of our field, 80 yards long. Um, seven on seven, every point starts with what we call a pull, which is like a kickoff. So our seven defensive guys will take the frisbee, we'll throw it as far as we can to the offensive team. And when they receive it, they're going to pass the Frisbee amongst themselves. There's seven players all the way down 80 yards and try to score it or catch it in the opposing field's end zone. Um, when you have the Frisbee, you have to set a pivot foot. So that player has the Frisbee. He's got a pivot foot. He can't run with it. He can't move with it. 
Um, he's trying to do whatever he can to throw it to his other six teammates. Those six teammates are running around. You might be a receiver making some long runs, some long cuts to the end zone, or you might be a little bit shorter receiver. You're trying to get the Frisbee um, really close to that thrower. You might be more of a handler. Um, so there are positions, but the unique thing is that you know, I've been a receiver. I'm 6'3". I'm one of the taller guys in Frisbee. I'm a receiver. But when I do catch it, I immediately turn into the thrower. I mean, I'm, all, I'm already the quarterback because I have the Frisbee. Um, now, early in my playing career, I got rid of that Frisbee as fast as I could to a thrower, and I went to go run. Um, and now as you, you know, play Frisbee longer, you can throw a lot better. You kind of play that hybrid. I could throw. I could catch. I can do anything in between. The defensive side's unique. Defense, all you have to do is uh, create an incomplete pass. Any incomplete pass is a turnover. Uh, much like soccer, when the turnover happens, the, that defense now turns into offense. They pick the Frisbee up. They start going. They're going to attack the other end zone. Um, and your offensive guys who were playing offense, they turn into defensive guys. Um, most points last between, you know, 8 and 15 throws. They're somewhat quick points. There might be throws. might be a point that ends in two or three throws. Um, someone that can throw it 60, 70 yards to the other end zone. Someone like me runs and catches it, makes it a really short point. Those are the fun ones that, that aren't dragging out too long. Uh, we like we like those. So it's um it's a hybrid of your your soccer's, your your basketball here and there. A lot of positioning like basketball, um, frisbees that hang a lot. You, people like the six three six four athletes that can run and jump because a frisbee might hang at ten feet for two or three seconds. So guys like me come in handy. Um, but then there's players that can throw it eighty yards. I still don't know how they do it, um, but they can do it, um, and it makes it easy for my job to go run and catch in the end zone. So I like those guys. So kind of going deeper with your specific skill set, because you're, you're tall, 6'3", you're light, you can jump. Like, what are some of the things that you're focused on during or like maybe the off season in preparation? Yeah, that's a great question because I found out early that I was never really going to want to be next to the disc and throw it and just kind of play that, that handler position. Those guys, they tend to be maybe a little bit shorter. I don't want to say slower. I think they've, they've, they've over time put some muscle on so they can throw that Frisbee a little bit longer. Um, I've always wanted to be the, the run or the guy going to get it. And so I've always tried to stay as, as lean as I needed to be. And I think when you go from college lean, um, you know, I probably weighed like 175, 180 in college and that was okay. Then you go play with the, the pro athletes or the, you know, the, the higher level club athletes and that's just too small. I'd get kind of pushed around a little bit when the frisbee was up in the air. Not that it's a contact sport, but you know, two men running for a frisbee, there's, you're going to collide somewhere. Um, and so if I you're always one seventy, you're going to bounce off the the, the two hundred pound. Absolutely, athlete. yeah. And and now playing at one ninety five when that frisbee goes up, I just think, oh, I'll just you know lean against this kid, lean against somebody, and I got the I got the weight for that. Um, but. There's a there's a time of, of the off season where I always try to get stronger. If I'm not if I'm not training for the the specific sport, my mind is always go get stronger. Um, when I'm in the middle of a season and you do a track workout Monday, an endurance workout Tuesday, and you're trying to taper for a Saturday game or a Saturday weekend, over the course of seven eight weeks of that, I'm losing weight. You know, I'm I'm, I'm constantly losing weight, and it's hard to keep weight on through a, an entire summer of playing frisbee. So when the off season rolls around, my mind is, how do I get a little bit stronger? How can I go into my season, you know, five to eight pounds a little bit heavier with the muscle side, knowing that I'm going to almost burn through it as I get through my entire season. I think you see that a lot in these NBA athletes and those guys that go into the off season. You're going, my gosh, look how big this person is. By the time the season rolls around, they've shrunk up a little bit because the day in and day out of just the grind is, is there. And our Frisbee season falls in the summertime. Bart, we live in Texas. You just walk out and you start sweating. Um, you know what that's all about. And so during a long weekend, we're losing, you know, seven, eight pounds of, of just that water weight, keeping the muscle on early and going through the, the season with the endurance side and the, and the speed side is a big factor. So stay with that understanding of the periodization of the season. Talk about how you taper the week. That's an interesting piece that I want to. Yeah. When I started playing, we played in the, and we played a club series. A club series is probably three weeks of normal practices three weeks of we might do some weekend stuff and then there's a large tournament where you play maybe four games on saturday and maybe three or four games on sunday and then you would have three weeks off again for the next tournament um, you would do maybe six tournaments in a year and so that's a really long season and what you're really doing is you're is you're trying to just stay as healthy as possible for these big tournaments so that you can go to these tournaments you can get a higher ranking to qualify for the next tournament or a better seating in the next tournament um, and that those seasons were all about the, the endurance side of things, I believe, because there was a lot going into these big weekends. 
And now that I play pro, we're playing one game on a Saturday. We might play a Saturday, Sunday doubleheader. But for the most part, it's it's making sure that your body is able to ramp up and every Saturday you're you're able to find that that peak level of performance. Um, and it's been unique going from a club season, which is three weeks to get ready for a, a two-day tournament, to I've got six days to be prepared for another Saturday. And so Sunday's recovery, I wasn't able to take a whole week of recovery, right? A whole week of recovery, I got a game again. So now it's, what am I doing Sunday? I'm going to go for a two or three mile steady pace um, run. I'm going to come back and I'm going to stretch for 30 minutes. I'm going to get into ice bath. I'm going to do that on Sunday because if I don't and Monday and Tuesday rolls around and I'm not able to get my workouts in for another Saturday coming up, I won't be ready for that Saturday. And so our recovery days are a lot quicker, allowing us to find a, you know, we want to, we want to go peak again on that Wednesday to have a Thursday, Friday kind of recovery window again. And then Saturday we go hard again. Um, and that's been, that was, been, that was a difficult thing for me my first few pro seasons of where do I find my recovery time? Um, I used to play a tournament on a, a club weekend and I would recover till the following Saturday. You know, I wouldn't, I didn't have toenails. My legs hurt. My, my everything hurt because you'd play seven games. Uh, but now just playing one going, okay, I need to wake up Sunday and, and move and recover and do those things. And, and now it's almost like the weekend gets here. Uh, and I'm ready. To, I'm primed again to go again because I've got all those extra recovery days, um, purposeful recovery days, not just taking the day off or laying on the couch going, hey, I got three weeks to do this next next time. So talk about recovery in the sense that you're also a trainer. You train athletes, you train general population, Camp Gladiator, obviously training lots of people. What do you tell your clients about recovery that, you know, just from your perspective, obviously they're not doing necessarily a, a big game on a Saturday, but oftentimes I feel like people that are loving fitness, they're loving working out, they, they have a hardest time just wrapping their head around the importance of recovery. So give us your perspective on that. It's always a, a really tough conversation because Bart, we, we train enough people who think if I just train seven straight days for the rest of my life, I would just be in, I would be in incredible shape and I could run a three hour marathon and I could do all these things. And, and then we have to talk them out of it. We have to talk them out of it, not because we don't want them to work out seven days, but we know to get to a three hour marathon or to get to a 5k pace that they're comfortable with the recovery is such a big part of it and it's not just the exercise part it's nutrition it's recovery it's water it's hydration there's a lot of things that would go into it um i always try to like when someone starts a program i always ask them what their goals are right because if they've got a goal i also can help them on the recovery side to get there and if you're going to your goal is to run a, a 20 minute 5k on a, on a certain saturday i'm going to ask them what are you going to do the friday before and they're going to say, I'm going to rest. And then, you, then they realize that rest is a, is a part of their journey that they can't on the Friday before run a 20-minute 5K so that the next day they can also do it. And so if you, if you get a goal with them and you start backing up saying, hey, what are your days going to look like? Where's your nutrition? Where's your hydration? Where's your rest days? It's a lot easier to convince somebody that this week, seven weeks out, that Thursday should be a rest day because they know how important it is to get to where their actual goal is. Uh, much much like a frisbee season or much like my teammates you know i tell my teammates if you guys need training help nutrition help i'm there for you i'm not necessarily the, the team trainer but it's just in our, our our blood to like help out a little bit i'm always telling them guys hey it's friday where's your gallon of water we've got a long game tomorrow we've got you know from from 4 30 showing up to practice you know for 20 minutes of throwing and walkthroughs and then game ends at 10 o'clock you're going to be drained you need to drink that water friday and just reminding them it's not Hey, let's go run a workout, be in super good shape. It's the recovery side. It's getting your body ready for when, when halftime rolls around and your body's going to say, hey, I got to sit for 10 minutes, but then ramp back up. You're able to do that because you're so well hydrated. You're much more well recovered throughout the, the entire week. I think without goals, it's hard to wrap your head around recovery. And I would recommend for anybody who's just starting a fitness program or jumping onto a team, whether it's you know basketball or intramural or frisbee, um, look at your season and find parts of that season where there's maybe a recovery week or recovery day or man, Saturdays look like it's going to be brutal for the next few months. Friday's my day. And I know that if I have a, a Friday day off, I can't miss a Thursday. That would be, that'd be, that wouldn't be very good for my training. So I got to hit every Thursday knowing that Friday is going to be off because I've got that goal. I've got that season. I already got that schedule in mind already. So looking kind of macro at the, not just like, hey, when should I take a recovery day, but like the big picture of why that day is important, when during the week is that day most important to have the, the success or the performance that you're looking for? Yep, that, absolutely. 
and I, and I don't I'm not a sponsored athlete, but I bought that this little whoop. Um, you, everyone's seen whoop. They're you know they're yeah. Bar, Bart's got his whoop on. He's got his battery pack on. He's charged, ready to go. Um, and I was able to say, hey, on Saturday I want to peak, um, but Friday I just want to get by. Not that like, hey, I can just slack off on my sleep and those types of things, but. I would have whoop kind of let me know, hey, it's Wednesday. You know, Thursday is going to be your perform day or your peak day. You got to get nine hours of sleep. Like it's 730. It's going to buzz. Hey, you need to go to bed. And, and, that, and that's allowed me to to go get in bed. And, you know, I hate saying this out loud on a podcast. People are going to hear this at 730 on a Tuesday because my whoop is saying, hey, you, you said to, tomorrow you're going to go hard and you're going to go run and you're going you're going to perform. You better go get a, your recovery on. And it's been really helpful. Now, I, I don't know if I even need the whoop. I kind of know my body and where my percentages will lay and my recovery score. But it's a good reminder that, hey, this is not because of Tuesday, Wednesday thing. It's Saturday's game day. And that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday have a purpose so that you can show up Saturday and hit your peak and get that 20 strain. Um, and that's what I'm looking for with that with the weekly you know schedule that I, I want to lay out. If you haven't heard about the Whoop Watch, you should absolutely check it out. Kevin and I both use them. It's fantastic. I wear it every day. I actually use it a lot for recovery and checking out my sleep patterns. It really lets me know when my body's fully recovered, not just because of how I slept or how long I slept, but looking at my heart rate variability, which is really a great indicator to notice, is my nervous system healthy? Is my nervous system back on track and ready to push my body? That really helps me know, hey, is this a day where I'm going to go super heavy or I'm going to push myself in the gym or maybe pull back a little bit, take a rest day that I was considering taking the next day. The other aspect of it is it really helps you track, obviously, workouts and just know where you're at as a holistic recovery device. I absolutely recommend it. I've been using it for about seven months now, and I'm absolutely hooked on it. I'm going to drop a link in the show notes so you can get a free month. You don't pay for the watch. It actually comes to you. You get a subscription. You can pay monthly, every six months, or yearly. I'm going to put a link in the show notes so you can get a free month to try it out. They'll send you the watch, you get a free month, and you can send it back after that month or keep going if you'd like. So check out the show notes for more information. Okay, back to the show. As people don't probably know a lot about uh, Ultimate Frisbee, they probably played it once, maybe in PE, maybe they've seen people play it, but they don't know that highest level. Why don't you tell about a moment this kind of comes up for you as like a favorite moment in like one of your pro games or that magic of the team and the whole kind of like, you know, coming together when it counts really shine through for you. I love that question. When I went to college, I didn't know what Frisbee was. I show up to a pickup game on a Sunday with my people in my dorm and there's a, a guy who's on the team at UNT, North, University of North Texas. And as we're playing, he says, hey, you know, there's an actual team here. You're pretty good. I bet they would love to, to have you. I, I play on the team as well. Um, and I'm thinking, I'm looking around at what I'm experiencing. I'm going, well, I don't want to do anything sort of like, I don't want to do this at all for the, my next four or five years. This is just chaos. It's 14 on 14. So then Tuesday, I roll up to the first practice. And as I'm walking up, there's a guy standing there. He's all by himself. And he's holding a Frisbee and he's practicing a throw. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, the rec center is right there. I can just walk past him. He doesn't know who I am. I can just skip this practice and just say I didn't do it. And then he throws it about 70 70 yards, 80 yards. I don't know. He just bombs it. And on the other end of the field is a guy standing there, and he catches it, and he throws it back. I'm like, are you kidding me? That That is incredible. And I meet the guy. His name's Matt. I go, Matt, is this the Frisbee practice? And he eyes me up and down. And he goes, yeah, this is the Frisbee practice. Do you play Frisbee? And I laugh. I said, no, I do not do anything what you just did. No, I do not. He goes, you don't have to do that. He goes, all you have to do is go catch that. And I'm like, that seems super easy. Like, let's, this sounds like a really cool idea. Let's, let's give this a shot. So more players show up. We're playing. I'm on Matt's team. And Matt's just looking at me. He's just giving me the heads up like, hey, I got it. Go. And I would run. And I scored 1,000 points that night. And I'm thinking, and I, I never threw it. I'd catch it and go, well, I'm not in the end zone. Like, now what do I do? I'm now I'm screwed. I can't throw it at anybody else. And I, you know, I figured it out after a while. But from from day one, I'm, you know, a freshman in college. I call my parents and I'm like, hey, I know I was gonna graduate in four years, but I found this Frisbee thing. You get five years of eligibility. Uh, I think I might as well just stay for all five years. My parents are like, hey, it's a team sport. We want to support you. Why not? Um, freshman year, we go to regionals, we get, you know, third or fourth place there. We're a decent team, but we're no near nowhere near nationals. 
um, the the next few years we start developing some players and my junior year I found myself as a captain and that's when I really looked at myself as a, a leader for the very first time I got to organize a practice I got to fly um, 18 20 year olds to Vegas for a three-day tournament and come home with all 18 people and, mm-hmm. and I had to go play and do all these things and organize it and stuff and luckily I had my brother was a captain with me and a guy named Peter another guy named David so they were helping out with that stuff my junior year was that tipping point of we're at these tournaments that we shouldn't be at we're a brand new school we've only been a team for three years but we're competing with every single team we're not beating them but we're competing and I'm looking across the line going these teams don't have four or five, six foot three athletes that can run and jump. They've got one or two. And if we can put this team together, you know, as my senior year, or even my fifth year, we have, we have a chance here. And so between my junior and senior year, I sat down with them, some of the University of Texas guys. And I said, y'all have been at nationals every year. How do you do it? And they talked about player development. They talked about setting goals. They talked about never missing a practice, having organization, leadership structure, coaches, all these things. And I'm looking back, I'm going, that is not at all what we're doing. We, we're just showing up on Tuesday and it's like, oh, look, you guys are here. You have a white jersey on. I got a dark jersey on. We're on two different teams. Um, and that was the tipping point. And going to our senior year, we are honestly a bar. We recruited from the basketball court. I'm like, I got enough guys I can throw. Let's go get all the six three six five guys that can run and jump because that doesn't exist in Frisbee. So we recruited some of those guys and we put together a pretty ragtag you know, bunch of guys going down to these tournaments. And that was what we did. We just showed up and we just out-athleted people. We said, hey, look, if you show up to this practice, the first 30 minutes is just conditioning with Kevin. And I knew that we'd go to these tournaments and we'd have to be the best in shape. We, had, we already had the height and the speed and stuff, but we were going to have to play maybe 10 guys only as hard as possible for an entire weekend. Um, going into our senior year, we set those lineups. We set that that mentality. We actually skipped a really big tournament. We finally got an invite into a super select tournament. We went to a different tournament. My team was really mad at me. I remember this, but my thought was momentum. Let's go to this tournament. Let's just go crush seven teams as hard as possible. I mean, just run them into the ground and show up to the sectionals being like, guys, we're awesome. We just, we just won seven in a row. No one can stop us. And we roll into sectionals. We've never beaten Texas in my four years. We since have never beaten Texas. We were going to that sectionals and we stomped them. We put them into the ground. We were at UT, at the intramural fields, and we said, look, y'all can't beat us. And we just lined up our six, four guys and said, hey, someone's going to go catch it in the end zone. And I remember looking at their team and they were thinking, how do we compete with them? Like, we just, we can't do it. Now, we ended up going to nationals that year. We ended up losing it pre-quarters, so we would have won that game. We would have been top eight in the entire nation we lose that game on ultimate points. So it was 12-12. We lost to Harvard 13-12. Um, but that was college to me. Those are my best 20, 20 friends. You play lacrosse, rugby, frisbee, whatever. You got teams and you got people that are on your team. You'll always remember that. That'll be your your your, your story for life. And I'll never forget that. Those five years were super impactful on, on my world. Yeah. In this sport specifically, you can literally not run with the Frisbee. You have to plant a foot. You can't, you have to pass it. There has to be a team element to winning. I would imagine you have to almost surrender to the, the team concept completely. You cannot will a victory. You have to, you know, work with your teammates, communicate well, you know, find those advantages within the context of the sport and the team. Uh, so even if you lose, you might, as a team, have played really well. It just didn't work out numbers-wise for you at the end of the game. All right, let's talk individual sports. And, and a couple that I want to highlight are the High Rocks competition and Camp Gladiator's CG Games. There's, there's a team component to CG Games, but let's talk about the individual side. When you're preparing for one of these competitions as an individual athlete, what are some of the things that you're specifically doing that like, at that high level, knowing you're looking to win this competition, what are you doing specifically to prepare yourself? Well, I'm such a team guy. As I'm preparing for these things, I look at my support system. Um, I look at who's going to be there the day of, who's going to be training with me, uh, you know, along the road, training for something in a solo sport can be lonely in a 12, 14, 18 week journey. And so finding a way to, to pull people along with you, whether they're doing the full thing with you or not, it, it, it allows that, that, that suffer moment on that long run Sunday or something. It's a little bit more bearable because you've got someone there with you that you can almost look at as a teammate. In my years of doing CG games solo, I've always planned that in my head. Which team is in my area that I can kind of attach to as a fifth teammate almost? 
And as they're, they're strategizing their days and their training, I'm just there with them talking about the movements, talking about the standards. And I'm almost the fifth teammate on their team, um, but I'm trying to push myself to that, that next level. Uh, I think the biggest difference, though, is, is the game day, right? That, that, that moment, that 8 a.m., 9 a.m., when you look around and you're at the start line, you're looking at the guys next to you, and your thought is, they're not on my team. Like these guys, actually, they don't care about me. They don't want me to succeed. They don't want me to cross the finish line. And, and I think I have that, that thought in my head where, and, and Bart, we're nice people. I look to my left and right and I'm like, man, I, I love Ryan Morgan. I hope this guy succeeds in everything he does. But the second that whistle blows, I think to myself, he just, he's not going to make it. And I'm going to beat him so bad. And then when we finish, I get to give him a hug because of how, how hard he tried. And I love Ryan as my example because there were so many times we went neck and neck and he beat me one time. I beat him one time. He beat me one time. But the hugs we've shared after that of like, that was awesome. Like, thanks for pushing me to my max. Um, but you got to flip that switch at the start line. You got to flip that switch and say, this is my competition. And the reason I signed up solo is that when I get to that start line and anywhere between that and the finish line, it's 100% on me. My failures are 100% on me. My success is 100% on me. Um, and you have to accept both of those things. And I've failed many times in individual sports, and um, that's probably why I gear more towards the, the team side a lot, because when you fail as a teammate, you can at least pick each other up. Um, and that's always, I can feel so bad on, on one of my plays or something as a team athlete, but I got teammates there to say, hey man, I got you, no big deal. As an individual, that's a little bit more scary. Um, and I would recommend anybody, if you're scared of that, if it's like one of those things, I don't know if I want to do this individual, man, sign up because when you do fail, it's just you. You didn't fail anybody else. You may have failed yourself, but you can pick yourself back up. We're strong people. Um, fail and then fail again and keep failing because you'll succeed at some point. And maybe you don't succeed by winning the trophy or winning that championship, but my goal one year was to just be on that that top four super finals. I mean, if I make it there and I heard my name, super finals, Kevin Richardson, I was like, I made it. Like I did it. And my, my energy level going into that was like, holy cow, I can actually do this. I, I qualified and I made my goal. Um, and and I, I failed the years before that, but the year that I, I succeeded, I was like, I made it, I did it. And I was so proud of myself. And you forget about every failure at that point because you've rose past those. You did something beyond that that you didn't in the previous years. Um, you forget about failures the second you succeed. So I tell people all the time, don't be afraid of that stuff. Go, go for it. Um, you'll never know what you can do unless you go get it. Being an athlete, you've got to be hydrated. You've got to be taking care of your muscles and your body so that you can perform at the highest level. That's why I love Mantra Labs' Hydrate Formula. This thing is a game changer with 1,200 milligrams of broad spectrum electrolytes plus 72 trace minerals, prebiotics, and vitamins. It comes in two great flavors too, lemonade and fruit punch. Normally, I'm all about the lemonade, but Mantra Labs might just have the best tasting fruit punch on the market, and I've tried them all. I literally go to the gym on a daily basis with like 88 ounces of Hydrate in my water bottle ready to go. I love supporting them too because it's an Austin-based company and they got the best quality ingredients on the market. And I feel better when I go work out with that Hydrate formula. I like taking the rise in the morning and I definitely use the rest right before bed so I can get absolutely the best sleep possible. So go to GoMantraLabs.com and use the discount code MINDSETFORGE to save 25% at checkout. The perspective of what is a failure, if I'm at CG Games Finals, you're already a massive success, right? You are one of the elite top 50 in the nation. But then there's like the little micro failures that might happen along the way. So I want to go into this kind of sports science concept around like, what do you do the moment after something goes wrong? You know, let's say it's a kind of obstacle course style thing. Something kind of goes wrong. You're not able to complete something or you get stuck on an obstacle and you have to kind of get your head back in the game. Talk about maybe something you do or you've learned to do that somebody could take and, and utilize. To look at the name of this podcast, right? And if you don't have the right mindset to find a way to improve or to find a way to reflect on that, um, most people aren't going to just win everything. Um, most people are going to find themselves, you said failure. I don't know if failure is the right word, but like hitting roadblocks, hitting obstacles, um, hitting something that you like self-doubt a little bit of like, I don't know if I can, I really don't know if I can do this. And I'll tell you a, a little story. So the year I won CG Games finals, I think it was 2016, um, we do the endurance event and they don't have us lined up in first through 50. So they're like, hey, whoever the first 10 people are, if you just want to show up and run, so I'm in the first wave and I go, I'm kind of looking left and right. And I finish, I think maybe third or fourth in my wave. 
So I leave and I go in and sit down. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I got third or fourth in the endurance event. I really was an endurance athlete. I'm going to be okay as we get to strength agility, as we get to interval in, in the obstacle course. Um, and I noticed that Matt Morton gets first place and Ryan Morgan gets second place. And I'm looking at, okay, I expected these guys to do really well, but I'm still going to be okay. So I go with strength and agility. Um, I come out of that like third or fourth and I'm still thinking, okay, I'm still in my head. I'm still going to super finals. I'm still going to be okay. But then there's a moment where they line us up one through 50 on the, on the interval. And one is is Matt Morton and I'm sitting at two and Ryan Morgan's three and they blow a whistle and you sprint down the hill and you grab a sandbag, I don't know, or, or a rucksack and you sprint up the hill. And I do the first one, I get there and I'm five seconds behind Matt and I'm three seconds behind Ryan. And immediately I go, oh my gosh, like, if I would have known how, how far behind I was earlier in the day, I would have had this self-doubt. I'm not going to do well. I'm not going to do well. So I have 45 seconds to recover in my head. I just lost round one. I've got five more rounds. What's going to happen? They blow the whistle. We go again. I come back. I'm six seconds behind Matt. I'm five seconds behind Ryan. And I'm going, oh, are, you, are you kidding me? This is not how I was supposed to go down. This is my event. This is how I'm going to win this thing. Third whistle, fourth whistle, fifth whistle, sixth whistle. I finished that sixth sprint. I don't even stop. I sign off my piece of paper. I run back to my tent. I take my shoes off. I tell my wife, Jesse, I'm, I'm just, I think I'm going to go home. I think I'm done. Like I just got my, my butt beat so bad by these guys. And I, my self-doubt was like, I can't do it. I'm done. I literally cannot win this thing. And I think she was there. I had some other teammates, Kevin Simons and that team that was there. And they're like, dude, it's just one event. It just doesn't matter. And I remember like 40 minutes of me just like sulking in this fact that it was embarrassing. They just beat me so bad. And I remember someone saying, but the O course is coming and you're the O course guy. The O course is no big deal. And so I remember lining up and this is the moment of standing that starting line, looking right, Matt, left, Ryan. I don't know who the fourth guy was and thinking to myself, it's just, it's about to go down. This is my re redemption here. And Ryan Morgan beat me and I beat Matt. But when Ryan hit the finish line, he laid down, he looked miserable. I finish and I look around and Matt Morton is struggling across the finish line and I'm thinking to myself, I feel great right now. I'm not tired. My legs aren't hurting. And these guys don't look very good. This is my event. I'm an O-course guy. And luckily, the Super Finals that year was the O-course. I'm thinking, oh, my, and my self-doubt went from, I'm about to just crush these guys. It just clicked finally. And all day long, third place, fifth place, ninth, I got ninth place in endurance. I'm going into Super Finals thinking, I'm in first place. I've got the ability to do this. And it was having someone flip that switch. My wife saying, put your stupid cleats back on. Go stand at that start line. Go kick their butt. That helped me out. But it was standing there going, man, this is it. This is my only. I just got my butt beat round three. Here's round four. Here's my last chance to prove myself. Um, and I could have walked into that thing just going, why? Why do this? I, I'm already in ninth place. I'm already in sixth, but whatever. But I was thinking, this is my event. And I could be last, last, last. If I get first in this one, I have a chance. Um, and that's what I remember about that is start line, peak finals or whatever, and going, I can beat these guys. I don't know why I thought that. They just crushed me for the last four hours, but I'm going, I can beat these guys. I don't know if that's because I'm a little bit dumb or naive or something, but um, I love that feeling of I'm back at the start line. I have control over this. I'm going to win. Um, and that's, I think, what changes people's minds sometimes. It sounds like you're having kind of a – conversation in your head about what can I honestly expect of myself? Like you're looking and saying, man, I'm getting beat over and over again. I just did this interval event. They smoked me. How am I ever going to compete at the highest level when it comes down to like the super finals? But then you have your moment and you, you, even though you didn't come in first, you showed up at the finish line, second place, not that gassed. The other guys are just like, <gasps> you know, just laying on their backs. Like, and you're going, wait a second. There's a, there's a window here where I could, you know, and I think that's so important that people understand, like there's a, we have to manage our expectations and it's important for us to, you know, and, and our mindset to utilize what's happening out there to, to help kind of validate that we can show up at our best. You kind of almost talked yourself out off the, off the edge there. When you went back and took your cleats off, you're like, I'm done. No way. You know, fortunately, Jesse showed up and, and got you to put your tough love. back on. Tough love, tough love from the wife. Yeah, hey, you got to have those people in your in your yep. life. Because if you had walked into the super finals, you know, just with that mindset, I mean, probably wouldn't have won. I, right? I remember mm -hmm. warming up. You know, you go sit for about forty five minutes, and I remember thinking to myself, I was so out of it. Why go warm up? Why not just go put my shoes on, go stand at the start line, and then just finish, and then go home? Like literally, then I'm done. I get to go home. 
in from that thought process to going over the corner by myself, doing a full warm up when you're already exhausted, like everything hurts and I'm going through a full warm up thinking I have a chance, like I can do this and I got one more event to prove that I can do this. And maybe I don't even get to super finals, but if I can show up to this event, at least I can leave with my head, you know, hung high. Like I, I completed this thing. I remember warming up for this event and I don't think anybody warmed up for that event. I think it was just, it's a battle of attrition. Who's just still alive by the, the fourth event. Um, and I just felt like that was in my mind of like, I'm an athlete. I have to do this. This is how I warm up all the stretches getting ready for it. And it's not just like, Oh, show up the start line, blow the whistle. I'm going to go. There's the preparation before that. And I remember taking that preparation, thinking to myself, I got one more event. This is it. One more. Um, and it helped out. You've kind of had those experiences, which have taught you that so much of your, of your performance is, is based around just having the right mindset. What do you do right now? Let's say you're, you're competing in a high rocks competition in Dallas and you know, you just feel like your mind or your body's just not responding quite the way you expected it to. And you are starting to kind of go down that road of like, you know, your mindset's not quite where you want it to be. What would you do or what have you done in the past that like kind of helps you kind of right the ship? And I think it's so important for people to, yeah, ideally we'd all walk into a competition just like right as rain, everything's like, and, but that's not the case. Like, you know, we get in a fight with our spouse the night before and we're like, crap, <laughs> you know, like we, we thought we had that going, but we don't now. We, 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 you know, we're thrown off. Breakfast wasn't what we expected it to be. Our stomach's a little off. You know, all those things happen. Life happens. How do you write yourself for those big moments when you show up? You know, I think about just the word reflection. Um, no one signs up on Thursday to do high rocks on Saturday. You know, you, you, I signed up in November to do high rocks um, last week, which was April 9th. So in my in my head, I have all these things I'm doing. I go for a five mile run in the middle of November. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I got high rocks coming up. You know, I got, it's like in 12 weeks from now, but I'm thinking, oh, this is because I've got an event coming up. So when you get to that day, you get to the week before, you know, I hurt my quad maybe two weeks ago. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've trained all this time for this high rocks event. My, my quad just, I don't know if I can do a sled push. I definitely can't lunge. And it's, I just kept thinking about it, but I was like, but I can run, man, I can ski really well. Rowing doesn't hurt. I'm just going through all these things and it's like, there's a road bump, but there's so many other things that you can do to accomplish those things. And you talk about like the day of, when the day of gets around, you, I've learned you can't do anything within 24 hours of an event to help yourself out at all. You just, you can't, there, there's nothing you can eat or drink or listen to, you know, a, a, a song or something. You've already put in the work you, that you need to do for that day. And so when the day happens and I'm, I think this is where Jesse and I are so different in a lot of our ways. Um, things can happen to me and it's like, I don't care. I just, nothing can phase me. I don't have the ups and downs. I'm a five. I like on a one to 10 scale. I'm just a five. I never get excited. I never get sad. I'm just super even keel. Luckily I'm married to someone who goes, hits a 10. Sometimes she's a one, but she's a 10. And so she can kind of help me get excited about some things, but uh, we're a good balance for each other. But when that day rolls around and things happen, it's like that, that doesn't hurt me at all. I, nothing can hurt me that, that morning or that day or breakfast or a relationship or a conversation uh, because I've, I've been on that journey. And in my mind, that five mile run, you know, four months earlier was to help me on that day. Um, the 24 hours leading up to it, nothing can really help me out. And I think going through a lot of tournaments, a lot of games, a lot of, you know, game day mentality, eating this, drinking this, pre-workout, post-workout, all these things, none of that's helped. Nothing's helped. What's helped is the preparation that I've put myself through for 12 weeks. So when that day gets there, it's like, well, I'm either super prepared or I'm, or I'm not at all. And we're going to find out when I get to that finish line how my body reacts. And for the most part, you do the right stuff, you're going to be okay. Um, you just can't let those outside external forces take over. Um, it's in your head. You got to think about it. I've done all this work. One thing, one conversation, one piece of food, whatever, that can't hurt me. I've done so much for the last 15 weeks. I'm, I'm going to be fine. I love that because it's preparation, you know, whether you're going out there and pre preparing to speak to a large audience or you're preparing to perform or you're preparing for an athletic event, like your confidence should come from the preparation, not some like self-talk, not a meditation, not a song that you listen to like the night before, like none of that stuff matters. It's the work you put in and the confidence comes from knowing you did the work, knowing you did everything you can. You're at, you're at the best possible place you need to be to compete at your highest level. And then, you know, the chips kind of fall where they may at that point. Yep, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm really new to this high rock stuff. High rocks has, has 
transformed a lot of the CrossFit athletes who have a really, really high level of endurance. When you're in a CrossFit competition, they're not really taxing you on the endurance side a whole lot. There's a lot more of that power lifting, of that functional fitness, a lot of body weight when it comes to the muscle ups and you know, box jumps, certain things like that. But the high rocks is really involved with the running really high cardiovascular output. There's obviously some strength components in it. The guys who are doing really, really well, you look at them and you're just thinking like, how are these big boys moving, right? They got a lot of muscle on them, but they have the ability to get that, that heart rate into that 180, 184 range and then just hold on to it for an hour. Now there's a, a thousand a kilometer run between every station. There's eight stations. And you're thinking to yourself, are they on their very first lap today? Did they just start? Or are they 55 minutes into this thing? You just don't know. The way they run, the way they look, I'm nowhere near where, the, where those guys are. And I see them you know, at, at the events I get to go to. I'm learning a lot from, from what they're doing to prepare for those things. And it's like, can you go run you know, a five and a half minute mile pace right after you do a 300 pound sled push? Well, first of all, I can't run that without doing a sled push. And I also can't <laughs> sled push that. So now I'm going, well, the answer to that is just a no, no, no. And I'm learning from these guys how to do that, right? How to go from a sled push, take off with these, I mean, just absolute heavy legs. And you're trying to move and you're going, in your mind, you're going right leg, left leg, right leg, left leg. Like that's how hard running is. Um, and I'm learning a lot of how to prepare the body for that. My wife and I just did the the pairs in, at High Rock. So we get to share all the stations. We get a run together. We get into a station. We can split up the row. I do 600 meters. She does 400 meters, right? So we can split that up, which is nice for the recovery side. Um, but it, it was also nice to see what other people are doing and how they can handle their body 55 minutes, 60 minutes into a workout, the breathing, the intensity, the recovery. Um, a lot of them are using the run as a recovery, but they're still running that six minute mile pace. Um, they're still cruising, but they're upright. Their chest is strong. They're breathing. There's a lot of like deep inhale exhales because when they get to that next station, you know, hundred wall balls or something, that's their moment to pass people. And they're going to go a hundred percent and they're going to run at 80%. And it's a fascinating sport to me. I'm super new to it. It's been around for about five years. I'm looking at the CrossFit games, CG games, the Spartans, the Decas, I'm looking at high rocks as they're going to be really popular. I think they're getting a lot of cardio people showing up, learning how to lift weights, getting a lot of people who are lifting weights backing up a little bit, getting a little bit more of the cardio, and they're creating some really good functional fitness athletes out there that can go win a 10K on a weekend and go win a powerlifting competition next weekend. Um, and I see those guys doing really well on high rocks. I'm looking to be that next level. I'm, I'm going to try to get through a Frisbee season where I'm going to be lean and I need to put some weight on for November, um, which will be high rocks happening in Dallas in November and go solo, um, see what the individual side of things look like for me and See if I can solo beat my wife and I's score of an hour and 10 minutes. Um, she did a lot of lunges and a lot of burpee broad jumps. So I got to work on those two skills um, so I can beat our, our combined score. Love it. Well, I'm going to put in the show notes just all the different links to some of these competitions so people that are listening can kind of check out more about them. CG Games prelims are in July of this year. You said High Rocks uh, November. Last question for you, man. Um, What's one word that describes your mindset as an athlete? I would say right now my, my word is balance. Jesse and I, we have, we have careers. We've got things that we're trying to plan for our future, and we're balancing that with competing in things like CG games and high rocks. Um, our Frisbee season starts here in a little bit, um, so weekly practices and, and weekends. I'm traveling either to Austin or I'm flying to you know, Atlanta or Raleigh or I have a game at home. And I look at the next eight months or so, and there's something happening almost every week that I got to kind of be dialed into. And at 36 years old, and I think balance is the biggest thing that I can do everything. I might not be able to do everything super well, but I can do everything if I plan for it. I communicate, you know, Jesse and I, we communicate about the things that we want to get ourselves into. Um, and I think if you don't have balance, as you get in the back end of your athletic career, you've got family, you've got life, you've got things you're planning for. You're not all 21 the entire time just going, oh, I got to just go play Frisbee and play around and not have to think about the life around you. And I think balance has been a big thing for me that I've had to learn. It's been a challenge. And I'd say I'm good at it now because I was so bad at it for so many years. And now I'm able to juggle things in the right way to give my time here and there as a leader of, of a team, as an individual player of a team or a spouse uh, that Jesse and I are trying to grow something together here. So I think balance is my word of the last few years of, of my career. 
Yeah, and I think there's a lot of listeners that are in the 30s and 40s that that are you know passionate about fitness, sports, but they obviously have their own professional careers, and so I think that really resonates definitely resonates with me as somebody who's got my own ambitions and bodybuilding and things like that so i really appreciate your time man thank you so much yeah bart this is amazing thanks for doing this i love the podcast and wish you the best of luck when you get to that point in your life like i'm at where you have multiple things going on kids family job also of course the thing you're passionate about you have to be able to manage everything and nothing needs to be like gotten rid of you have to love all the things in your life but you just got to find how do i do it all really well i love that point about balance kevin does a lot he's a director with camp gladiator he's a trainer he obviously is a elite athlete doing a lot of different things scheduled every weekend and him and his wife have to figure out how to do it and i think that's what we've got to always remember is that like we've got to put everything into our passion into our sport But we've also got to be able to manage the other things in life so that we can give our best and still not derail in the other things that are so important in life. One of the takeaways I got, and I don't know if you heard this or reflected on this, was just, you know, the idea that if you plan far enough ahead for something, then you really can't get knocked down. I mean, of course, injury, sure. You know, it's the old saying, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. If you do the work and you plan it out and you know I've done every single thing I could to be ready, then it's going to be a success. It may not be exactly what you thought. You may not win the whole thing if you're going for a competition or you're in a tournament or something like that, but you're going to give your best and you should be proud of the effort that you put out there. I think that's what we can all strive for. When we're going to the gym or you're going on that run or you're doing your thing or you're competing, you got to give max effort. you got to be able to say, hey, I put everything I had into it. I was the best I could be in this moment, and now I can learn from some of my mistakes, come back even better the next time. So a couple plugs here. We talked about the Whoop Band, and I'm going to drop it in the show notes, kind of how you can get a free month of the Whoop Band. CrossFit athletes use it. It's really popular these days, so it may take a month or so to actually order it because they have a back order. But I would jump on that website, fill out a form, order it, get a free month, try it out, use it with your phone app. It's so addicting because you can get so much information it's super valuable and it can really help you plan out the hard days versus the rest days and know how your body is responding to the amount of strain you're putting on it day in and day out and also of course your recovery with sleep and your heart rate variability knowing those things being able to see where you're stressed where your body is overly strained and where maybe it's time to pull back and do a deload week or something like that also if you're interested in one of these competitions, you can look at High Rocks. That link's going to be in the show notes. And CG Games, this is their Camp Gladiator style games. It happens in July. It's for all fitness levels. You can go sign up for the competitive division. You can do a team, co-ed. It's all based on age. There's a 18 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, and now 60 plus divisions. So all different age groups can get involved. So many options. And then there's a non-competitive division so that you can just participate much like signing up for a 5K. You don't need to win it. You just want to participate. All those options there for you. There'll be two here in Austin, three in Dallas. So check out the show notes for more information on that. And remember, our goal every week is to get 1% better by listening to this podcast and implementing the ideas that we're learning from my guests and from my solo cast so that we can level up. So thanks for listening to the Mindset Forge podcast.